All right, we have Michael Bruno and Christopher Kennedy here for match one in this round five. I believe Michael Bruno is playing an Amethyst Steel list while Christopher is on Emerald Steel. We've seen lots of this squirrel in uh, the Bucky today. It looks like Christopher is going to go first, though. Yes, yeah, it, I, we have, it's just a sea of steel out there. It does yes. feel like, you know, and I think that it makes sense with the current meta and a lot of those cards out there that steel just has a lot of answers. Right, I mean, even looking at Michael's hand that Christopher gets to see by playing this Diablo, there's a couple of removal cards in there between Baboom and I saw a Smash, Smash. in there as well. Mm -hmm. So steel just has a lot of great answers to what is a little bit slower of a metagame, but there are cards like Diablo, like Flynn Rider, that you want to get rid of as fast as possible, and Steel just has great removal. Uh, it lends itself to removing those cards a bit easier. Yeah, and I really love the Amethyst Steel combo. I think that we see a lot of Emerald Steel, of course. We're uh, really familiar with the Bucky and Floodborns and all of that, the Diablos, um, but the Amethyst Steel is not as popular of a deck, but it's a really fun one. It's an extremely fun deck. I played it for a little while, and Rise of the Floodborne, it has evolved a lot since then. And the first thing that I question when I see those two inks together is, are we playing Jafar? There's ah. a couple different uh, lists that play Amethyst Steel. There's a Jafar list that likes to play Whole New World and can win the game from Jafar singing Whole New World. But then there's a more of a mid-range list that likes to play Merlin Rabbits and, and uh, Madame M Snakes and yep. a lot of those types of characters. And there's even some broom variations of the decks. It yes. likes to play Magic Brooms as well. So I'm very eager to see what we have here with Michael. We already see a Merlin Rabbit and a Merlin a goat, goat in his hand uh, after him playing the Chernobog followers, which is a one drop I really like to see when you quest with the Chernobog followers. You can banish it and then put it into your discard and draw a card. But instead, we see Michael just questing with the Chernobog followers so that they can play the Madame M Snake because you have to bounce a character back to your hand when you play Madame M Snake. Yes. Yeah, those Matter Mims and the Merlins um, are the bounce, considered the bounce package, yes. <laughs> as they say, um, of the, uh, you know, in Amethyst Inc. And it's really fun that the mechanics there between the interactions that you can have with the Merlins and the Mims going back and forth, the bouncing goats and all yes. of that. Um, really, really fun cards, really fun theming there with the characters. Um, and there's, Actually, uh, I, we just saw recently revealed a new card coming in the next set, Shimmering Skies. We have a Madame Mim in her elephant, yeah, the form. elephant form. Yes. So there's actually, uh, I think, 15 total an oh, possible geez. animals be be <laughs> between Mim and Merlin in, in the movie, Sword in the Stone, that there's a total of 15 different animals they turn into. So th we might see some more. You know, <laughs> you know who else has a lot of animals? Prince Ali. Or there's like a song yes. about that, about all the animals There he has. is. He has, yeah, like, what is it, 1,700? Yeah, you know, it's a bunch of velvet. God, I forget. I can't remember all of it. Golden camels and yeah. things. Well, I guess the camels aren't alive. They're when, golden. But when you can view them for free. Anyway. We have two Buckies. <laughs> yes. Anyway, we have two Buckies down on Christopher's side of the board. You know, we have seen some matches earlier in the day that um, Emerald Steel players have been struggling to find any Buckies, but now we see... Two on There's the board, two, yes. which has got to be pretty scary for Michael. I think it is. Luckily, Michael's playing a Amethyst Inc. And, and the reason that's lucky is because Amethyst lends itself to a lot of cards that draw a card. We see the Maleficent Sorceress being played that mm -hmm. simply says, when you play this card, draw a card. And so Christopher having two Buckies on board is going to start ripping apart Michael's hand if Michael's not able to um, draw extra cards for turn basically yeah so we saw a jafar dread not being played last turn which forced michael to discard two cards any other floodborns that get played is going to make them discard a bunch of cards as well and one thing that i like about the amethyst steel list over something like an amethyst ruby list is you can play a little bit lower to the ground so in amethyst ruby a lot of times you're looking to get to your six or seven drop characters or songs like be prepared Whereas Amethyst Steel, we talked about earlier, it ha it lends itself to a lot of removal cards yeah. that are a little bit cheaper. So although you can't specifically play Baboom or Smash on a Bucky, you do have Grab Your Swords that's slightly cheaper that, mm -hmm. at 5 ink. So you, can, you have a little bit of leniency and a little bit of uh, extra time, I suppose, to get yourself to that 5 ink or 6 ink so that you can hopefully find an answer to these Buckies. Yeah, with having two down on the board, he Michael's going to have to find some answers pretty quickly. Otherwise, yeah, it's really going to start demolishing his whole hand and not leaving him with many of those options that you're talking about, like a grab your swords or 
um, like a Tinkerbell maybe yeah. or Avalanche is an action, you know, that I've seen. Um, yeah, there's some good answers in Steel, uh, but the question is, can he keep enough cards in hand to find them? <laughs> yeah, and even just looking at the cards in Michael's hand and the cards that are on board, I mean, I see a Friends on the other side. I see Trinobox followers. There's a Magic Smash. Broom in there as well. Mm -hmm. All of those cards are drawing Michael cards. And so I think for the first multiple turns of the game, Michael's game plan is just to continue to draw extra cards every turn so that hopefully... You can get to the mid game or later into the game where you do find those Bucky answers. We do see Christopher uh, choosing to challenge and banish the Maleficent Sorceress with the Jafar Dreadnought. That'll allow Christopher to draw a card off of Jafar Dreadnought. And then we see the Flynn Rider being played, which is a really fun card. Yeah. Yeah. Flynn Rider is, like you said before earlier in the day, is really made for a discard deck. Yeah. You know? So if you can empty your opponent's hand, Flynn quests for four, plus he's evasive. Um, and so just a really, really strong card there if you can, you know, get the discard machine happening. This really is a perfect card for the deck because it is a game finisher with all of the lore if you can mm -hmm. get your cards out of your opponent's hand. It's also a Floodborne. So when you yes. play the card, you are forcing <laughs> your opponent to discard cards with those two Buckies. Michael had to discard two cards. I think I saw a, a Magic Broom being discarded and something else that I had missed, but... It's perfect because it's doing what it is designed to do when paired with this Bucky. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Flynn Rider doesn't stay for very long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he is banished from that smash that came down, um, which is good because I don't know that there's many, uh, you know, there. well, there are some evasive characters he could have, but none that he had in hand that could come down and challenge Flynn. Yeah, there's not typically a lot of evasive characters that see play, I think, in Amethyst Steel. Uh, there's a couple characters like... Peter Pan. Yeah, there's a Peter Pan Shadow Finder and also Peter Pan Shadow. Neither of those have enough strength, I don't think, to banish Flynn uh, as they're played. There's also like a two-cost 3-2 Jafar and Steel that gains evasive on your turn yes. that people sometimes play. So if this were a Jafar list, I would expect to see uh, one of those cards, but I'm not getting that i've never i'm not seeing any jafar so far i'm expecting this to be a bit more of a mid-range him with a steel list personally but still having that steel removal with something like smash immediately get rid of the flan we saw the baboon played on the jafar dreadnought to get rid of christopher's board i think michael is setting himself up to be in a solid place you have the merlin rabbit that you can bounce if you need to i think that's a friends on the other side in his hand that can potentially be sung okay well not anymore <laughs> <laughs> um but Different ways to draw cards. Oh, no, we oh. see an Aladdin being played. Wow, and Christopher actually doesn't have any cards left in hand now. He played his last card, being that Aladdin, forcing Michael to discard some cards from his hand. But now Christopher is left empty-handed. And unfortunately, one of the big cards in the Emerald Steel list to help with card draw is the, the Floodborne Diablo, which we've not seen yet. Yes. Christopher has not seen the Floodborne Diablo yet, so both players are on very low cards in hand. I don't think Michael has a card that draws him cards in his hand currently, and both players are top decking at this point. We're in a weird scenario, too, because the Madam M Snake doesn't exactly want to quest because then the Aladdin gets to challenge into it next turn, but also if the Aladdin quests, the same thing can happen for Michael. Michael currently is... Wow. Ahead in lore, so yeah. he has more incentive to quest with Snake and just go ahead and force Christopher to answer it. We do see Christopher singing. I believe that was a Let the Storm Rage On yep. with the Aladdin to deal a little bit of damage to the snake. And, you ah. know, Caster Curse. We have yep. <laughs> we talk about talk. the Diablo, and there it is. <laughs> and there it is, <laughs> uh, which is great for Christopher, not so great for Michael, because um, Michael also now is empty-handed. Um, I guess the good thing about that is Bucky doesn't have any cards to discard. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's really going to give Christopher an advantage here. What do you think that Michael is hoping for? Uh, I think Michael needs some cards to help him get back into this game. A, a rabbit is a great place great. to start <laughs> to let him draw some extra cards. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword because there's still those two Buckies in play. I expect Michael to banish the Buckies one in one form or another, whether that's through uh, any cards that he can that he draws or just challenging one of them with a Madame Snake. But every card that he draws is potentially a card that gets discarded. So you want to be inking and playing these cards if you can. And uh, we, so we actually see this uh, 
Snake challenge and banish the Aladdin instead, keeping the Buckies in play. But outside of that, I think Michael's looking to find maybe a Tinkerbell giant fairy, potentially a grab your sword. A grab your sword would be great here, actually, because it would yeah, that banish would, that everything. Yeah, that would banish everything. Yeah, grab your swords would be great. Uh, what do you think the choice was there, the thought process about choosing to banish the Aladdin instead of one of those Buckies? Is it just because Michael doesn't have any cards in hand? Yeah, I think it's because the Buckies aren't getting too much value right now due to Michael not having any cards in hand. Um, but also, Aladdin's a three-cost character, so Aladdin can sing songs, you know, and you don't want to give Christopher the opportunity to gain any value out of songs he might draw off the top of his deck that you can then sing with Aladdin. Cards like Let the Storm Rage On that would let you yes. draw extra cards. And so getting rid of the Aladdin just trades both of those characters, and then Michael knows whatever card I'm drawing, I'm either playing it this turn or I'm inking it. The Buckies are only gaining one lore per turn. The Aladdin was gaining only one lore, too, but the Aladdin was a little bit scarier because of his ability to sing. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Michael is thinking here. Was, I can't tell if he has another card in hand or... I think he just played in Along Came Zeus and banished the Exerted Diablo. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what else, like you mentioned, if he has anything else in hand he's considering or not. I think it has gone to Christopher for this turn, though. Yes, and... Yeah, this... this... Okay. Okay, so he just has one rabbit in hand. That's it. Oh, look oh. at these Ursulas come <laughs> down. Wow, that's fun. Yes, Ursula comes down. The Ursula Deceiver, which lets Christopher look at Michael's hand again and discard a song card. Of course, there's only the Merlin Rabbit, so that doesn't happen. But then Ursula Deceiver of, of All, which Christopher can sing with Ursula Deceiver of All a song twice. You can sing the song twice then put the song at the bottom of your deck. Fortunately for Michael, none of those were Floodborne cards, or else he would have had to discard <laughs> the one rabbit. rabbit that he had, which he definitely needs to get another card. Yes, he needs to get another card, but it's bittersweet because Christopher has this exerted Diablo, which means every time he draws with rabbit, and it looks like he drew into a snake, you know, if Michael decided to play the snake on the rabbit, bounce the rabbit again, Christopher is drawing again off of Michael's rabbit. So it's a weird thing where Michael wants to be drawing more cards to find answers, but so long as this Diablo is exerted, you're also kind of helping Christopher as well. Yeah, and because, of course, that Diablo is evasive, uh, Michael is not going to be able to challenge. Oh, and he did have a goat in hand. So. Okay, we do see Merlin goat being played, which will gain a lore when it enters and leaves play, similar to how the Merlin rabbit draws a card when it enters and leaves play. This is that fun... A mechanic that you were talking about earlier with the Merlins and Mims being able to bounce each other back and forth and benefit off of, the, of each other. Yeah. Uh, so Christopher has got to be feeling pretty good with the state of his board right now, but do you think that Michael's presenting a lot of threat here? What do you think Christopher's hoping to do? This has been a pretty slow game, to be honest with you. This is what happens when we have two steel matchups. They both end up playing a bunch of damage removal on each other, trying to gain control over the other person on the board. And so far, it's been a pretty tight race in that regard. Christopher is building up a really wide board with some very good cards. You see another Diablo being played. And that Diablo won't be able to exert this turn, but the next one will be able to. And if Christopher has any songs, can potentially double sing them with the Ursula. So I think right now, Christopher is presenting a stronger board. The issue for Christopher is all of these characters only quest for one. Yeah. And some of these characters you don't want to exert, like the Bucky. And so you're not exactly gaining a ton of lore immediately. Um, you can, of course, exert the evasive characters if you would like to. And we do see him move some of them to the Hidden, hidden cove. cove. I was wondering, I, I, I saw him play another card, and I thought maybe it was a Hidden Cove, and it is. Um, which then, if he does play Grab Your Swords, yes. would not take care of those two Diablos because they now are basically three three characters with that extra strength and willpower from Hidden Cove. Right. It changes a lot of what Michael needs to come back from this game for the exact reasons that you said. Christopher moving the arguably most important characters on his side of the board to the Hidden Cove so that they aren't banished by the Grab Your Sword because, like I said, a lot of cards in Michael's deck draw him cards. And so when you have two Diablos on two board... Two Diablos. You know, <laughs> and you draw cards as much as you want, Michael. I, yes, no <laughs> Christopher yeah, would Christopher's love it. Yeah, Christopher's like, your friends are my friends now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. His, uh, Michael's friends really are on the other side. <laughs> they are. They are on the other side of the board. That's a good one. Oh. So we do see Michael quest out here. I think they ended up banishing something. I didn't see what that was. Um, I, they, they, I, he, 
Was it an Ursula? I don't know. No, he. I don't think he did. Oh, did he not banish anything? Okay. No. No, it's just hard to, unless he was the, the hidden cove. Yeah. It could have been the cove off screen. I can tell if it was off screen. Yeah, I think he did run into the hidden cove, which makes sense that he would want to get right. rid of that. Right. Michael's looking towards his outs. He knows that if all these characters hit at the hidden cove, all of his steel damage removal is less effective than normal. So the first thing you got to do is get rid of that hidden cove because if Michael can top deck a grab your swords or even a Tinkerbell would be a start, yeah. then this whole game turns around, especially now that Christopher challenged the rabbit with both of the Ursulas. They have damage on them right now. So any sort of AOE or area of effect damage like grab your swords would banish Christopher's entire board right now and could be a great way for Michael to come back. Yeah, besides grab your swords, is there anything else that you think Christopher really does not want to see from Michael said? I any um any card that does widespread damage, like you mentioned Avalanche earlier, some people like to play that card. It'll deal one damage to all opposing characters. A Tinkerbell would do the same thing. Uh other removal cards would be fine for Michael just to get rid of something, like to yeah. get rid of one or two of the Diablos. These goats are pretty strong as well because they're just gaining lore every time they're played. And then you can, they're pretty good challengers as well with four strength and three willpower. So if you can use it to start taking out some of Christopher's board here, we see Michael challenging the Ursula Deceiver with the magic broom, starting to uh, gain more control over what Christopher's done with such a wide board. And then if Christopher decides to retaliate and banish any of those Merlin goats, you're going to gain a lore off of them anyway. So um, they're pretty safe to either quest or challenge whatever you need to do with them currently. Yeah. And we did see that Madame Mim Snake challenge the Ursula Deceiver of All, which I think is, oh, we there was oh, a, a Flynn. Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> that changes things Flynn, a little. Flynn was hiding in the shadows. We didn't see him there. Yeah, we are... Uh, you know, seeing still a very wide board on Christopher's side, and that Flynn does really change things because Michael is sitting without a hand. Yeah, so with Michael not having any cards in hand, Flynn Rider will quest for four lore the next turn. He's also an evasive character, so going to be tough for Michael to banish. And we see Christopher at nine lore currently. That'd be four, five, six, seven Eight. at the next turn, I think. Oh, Christopher would have eight, I think. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lore next turn, which would put him at 17. So. Christopher also has a very healthy hand size. We see him playing a couple action cards to remove some of Michael's characters so that Michael can't challenge and uh, gain more control over Christopher's board on this next turn. So there's not a lot that Michael can touch, to be honest. The, the, both the Diablos and the Flynn Riders are evasive. Uh, I'm not sure Christopher's going to quest with the Bucky. He may want to keep that around to make sure that Michael can't keep any cards in hand. And, mm -hmm. and the Diablo is going to get an extra lore, but you're probably not shifting it because Cross unless you want oh. to specifically shift it uh, to exert it that turn. But we do see. Yeah, what do you think about that move there? Yeah, the Bucky getting rid of the Madame Mim Snake. I don't hate this just because the Bucky's not gaining too much value with, while Michael doesn't have cards in hand, so there's no cards to discard for Bucky, uh, and Bucky's only going to quest for one lore every turn. Christopher understands that, you know, if there's a grab your sword or a Tinkerbell that gets uh, pulled off the top, then it's going to be banished anyway, so might as well use the Bucky to uh, keep control of your board by banishing the snake for Michael. Yeah. Now, it looks like maybe Michael went ahead and conceded that game. <laughs> he saw there was too many birds, too many squirrels. There was a, a an animal menagerie over there, and then we had that fox come down there at the end. Yeah, there were a <laughs> bunch of animals, hard to catch. Now, going in here, you, you know, you talked before about how amethyst steel can kind of go a lot of different ways. Now that we've seen what Michael has, what do you think his strategy is Going in, knowing that he has these buckies to deal with, is it, uh, you know, and does all the floodborns come in to make him discard his hand? What's he going to do here? So I think there's a bit of a balancing act that Michael's going to have to play. You have a lot of the card draw from Amethyst, and so I think very similar to a Ruby Amethyst matchup. Is that an enchanted oh, card? It is Ooh. an enchanted card. Is that an. I can't tell what it is. Is that an Ursula or a Yen Sid? It's, a, it's an enchanted Yen Sid. Oh, my goodness. So we see the Yen Sid with the brooms enchanted. Wow. That's, That's awesome. Fun. I always get excited when we see enchanted cards I on stream. Know. <laughs> I do, too. I love seeing those enchanteds. They are so incredible. The art on them, the foiling, 
the holographic, you know. Yes, <laughs> and there it is. Michael plays There's our Yen Sid. Yen Sid lets you draw a card or gives you the option to draw a card uh, if there's also a magic broom in play when you play the Yen Sid. And then if you have two or more brooms in play, then Yen Sid quests for an extra two lore. So it can be a really strong and aggressive play in the beginning, drawing you a card, which is exactly what you want to do against Emerald Steel, going back to your question, Rebecca. Yeah, I yeah. Think, think Amethyst wants to just draw cards for the first couple of turns of the game. You don't want to hold on to too many of those songs that we talked about that Michael wants to use, like Grab Your Sword, because we know that Christopher's playing those Ursula Deceivers. You don't want Ursula Deceiver to uh, discard that card from your hand when you need it. So I, if I had to guess, Michael's just looking for the first three or four turns of the game to Keep drawing cards so that if Christopher has a Bucky to play on turn two and starts doing the Bucky Diablo Floodborne discard engine, you can at least keep up until you can get to those five ink, six ink cards that you can safely play. Yeah, it looks like in Michael's hand that he has a a rabbit and a queen's castle, which both of those are four costs, so we're a couple turns away. But even now, I know he's got to be thinking what direction he wants to go. Uh, you know, what, do you think that Queen's Castle is going to come into play this game? We didn't see it last game. I think it definitely could because you're, you're absolutely right. There's two paths that Michael can take here with both a rabbit and a location in play. Emerald Steel historically does not have a lot of characters that have a lot of strength. So when you play a card like Queen's Castle that has seven willpower, it's, you're probably going to get at least one or two turns out of it before they banish the card. And also, if they're challenging a location, they're not questing for the turn or they're not singing songs, which you're pretty okay with as well. It gives you a couple turns to build up your board or draw some extra cards, find some answers. At the same time, if Christopher had played a Bucky last turn and you knew that he was going to be discarding cards out of your hand, the rabbit looks a lot more enticing there because you can play them at it, uh, the rabbit, immediately draw a card, potentially bounce the rabbit if you have any snakes or foxes in your hand and continue to try to mitigate the discard that Bucky is providing. Since we don't see a Bucky being played, I wouldn't be surprised if Michael does around turn four play the Queen's Castle because if the Queen's Castle lasts a turn, then the turn after that, you can move a bunch of your characters to the Queen's Castle. And if it survives the turn again, then for every character at the Queen's Castle, you get to draw an extra card for turn, which yes. co would completely undo what Emerald Steel is trying to do in decreasing your hand size as fast as it can. Yeah. So we do see a Baboom come in and do two damage onto Diablo, which would normally banish Diablo, but because of that hidden cove. <laughs> yes, we see how much work this yeah. hidden cove is doing. Just that one extra willpower can make all of the difference between the two damage and the three, keeping the Diablo alive, making it so that all of these cards that Michael wants to draw, uh, Christopher is going to draw as well, so long as the Diablo is exerted. Yeah, and then it looks like instead of questing, that Michael's decided to put some damage onto that hidden cove, probably just for that reason. Yeah, I think so. We talked earlier about some of the cards that I think Michael really wants to look for, either whether they're cards that deal widespread damage or, or more direct damage. In Lorcana, there's a huge breakpoint between certain willpowers, and so being able to make sure that the characters have the willpower you're expecting them to be and fall into yeah. those two damage or three damage actions and uh, songs that you're trying to play can be really important. You got Christopher got two looks at Michael's hand <laughs> there with the back-to-back Diablo followed up by the Ursula, or Ursula and then by Diablo. Of course, the Ursula, he got to force Michael to discard a song, which he did have, that Let the Storm Rage On, yeah. which is uh, unfortunate because that would have come in pretty handy. Yeah, could have used that to banish the Diablo next turn and also draw a card yourself. Uh, unfortunately, won't be able to do that because it was discarded. We also don't have anything to sing it, mm -hmm. so I think it still would have been fine to play, but uh, you usually want to sing those songs if you can. Now, this is interesting because Michael has that queen's castle and a rabbit, and then he drew another rabbit. He, he, the only inkable card in his hand is the queen's castle. Yeah, <laughs> and we see Michael reluctantly inking the queen's castle because you have to, especially in uh, against Emerald Steel when you don't know how many cards you're going to have in your hand at any time. You got to get ink into the inkwell while you can. And the rabbit is still a perfectly fine play oh, absolutely. at the end of the day to draw a card. It's essentially a guaranteed draw two. So the rabbit is a perfectly fine play here. It just means the game may not go as fast for Michael as he wanted it to with the Queen's Castle gaining two lore every turn. Yes. And because the Hidden Cove got banished, Diablo automatically was banished because, of course, 
Hidden yeah. Cove dropped off the that strength once it was banished, so Diablo had enough damage on him. And we see Flynn making another appearance. Yeah, we see Flynn being played, and then Ursula Deceiver challenging the Trinobog followers to banish it so that Michael doesn't get that draw off of the Trinobog's followers when he quests to banish it and draw a card. Oh, we draw a friends. This is a great draw off of the top for Michael. Can potentially sing this with Rabbit, draw an extra two cards. Yeah, the friends on the other side is one of those cards that I don't think you ever see an Amethyst player without. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> any I know any time that I'm trying to build an Amethyst deck, there's a couple cards in there that I put in automatically no matter included. what. Absolutely. Friends on the other side is definitely one of them. And we see the strength here of the Madam M and Merlin package. The Madam M Fox being able to bounce the Merlin Rabbit back to Michael's hand, allowing him to draw another card because Rabbit left play. And then Fox has rush, so can immediately rush into this Ursula Deceiver, banishing that for turn. Michael doesn't have to use the Magic Broom or the Yin Sid to get rid of the Ursula. What's really interesting about this game is that it's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of challenging, a lot of damage, with different actions and songs. And we are still sitting at just <laughs> one and two lore here. Not a lot of questing happening yet. No, these steel matches can be a little bit of a grind for that reason. For the majority of the game, it's just fighting over board presence. See who can get the advantage, usually through these steel songs like uh, Let the Storm Rage On or Strength of Raging Fire. And a lot of these color pairings as well, you have characters that trade efficiently like the Madame M. Fox or uh, sometimes you have like a Robin Champion of Sherwood that gets played. So most of the game is spent fighting over the board until somebody inevitably wins and inevitably has a, a hand advantage. And what I mean by that is just you have more cards more in cards. hand, maybe your opponent doesn't have many cards in hand, and then you can really start going out on board and start questing for a bunch uh, and using that advantage. Yeah. Now, we did see a, a broom in Michael's hand, and he has now two Yen Sids on the board. So if he plays his other broom... He could actually uh, quest for three, which each of each of those Yen Sids. Yeah, so that would be a total of six lore between the two Yen Sids. I think this Yen Sid was played this turn. Last turn. Oh, so it was last yes, turn. Yeah, so that's last turn. extra scary. A burst of lore there with both of the Yen Sids if we quest. And the great thing is Christopher's board does not look super scary either. You just have the Ursula uh, Deceiver of All. You have the Flynn Rider and the Diablo, none of which have a ton of strength. The Flint Rider is the most is the strongest card on their side of the board with two strength. And so Yen Sid having three willpower means that it would be especially difficult for Christopher to banish those Yen Sids anyway if we do exert the Yen Sids. And you called it right out, Rebecca. Brooms. <laughs> we see the magic Brooms. broom being played, <laughs> giving one of the Yen Sids resist. Or sorry, no, that's the evasive uh, broom. Questing with the Yen Sids for six total. Yeah, the brooms and Yen Sid synergy is just really fantastic. Of course, we, we got some brooms. There's also some Mickey cards, um, mm -hmm. Mickey Sorcerer, and um, that have some synergy there. Since set one, you know, we saw some brooms. And every set since then, we've seen some more brooms come into play. This last set, we got Yen Sid. And I think that the players are really enjoying of some of these new cards and how they work together. I'm inclined to agree. I feel like since the beginning, when we saw the Mickey Wayward Sorcerer yes. and we saw the other Magic Broom, everybody, a fan favorite, has yes. been the Magic Broom. Absolutely. And everybody's joked about eventually seeing the Magic Brooms at the top tables. And we finally <laughs> have enough here that, like, here they are. We're playing Yin Sid and a Broom Amethyst Steel deck, and it's doing well. Being able to quest for six in that turn, potentially playing a couple extra Brooms to keep those Yin Sids online, you know, Talk about how strong Flynn can be with the four lore that he can gain per, tur per turn, depending on how many cards are in your opponent's hand. Same thing for the Yin Sids. They can get out of hand very quickly. Yeah. And uh, Christopher said, uh, no, thank you. And along came <laughs> Zeus and to take that other broom off the board. Um, and I guess my guess is there's a few reasons for that. But why do you think he chose that broom over some of the other characters on the board? Yeah. So the... Broom specifically that he banished has evasive on Michael's turn. So not only is it allowing, it's a one extra broom for the Yin Sid to potentially give it three lore, but if Christopher has any Diablos that they want to play or even any of the Flynn Riders that we saw that were on board, he can't really exert those characters without them being threatened from this magic broom because it'll have evasive. It can challenge those evasive characters in turn. Yes, and and 
Christopher played that along came Zeus, and then Michael says, well, I will meet you <laughs> with an, uh, my own along came Zeus, and goodbye to your Flynn. <laughs> yeah, the gods don't play favorites. <laughs> Zeus is on each side. Yes, absolutely. Flinging lightning bolts. <laughs> the lightning bolts coming down every direction, and there, like you said, we just kind of see this, this battle of the steel going on. Yeah, it's just constant steel removal, each player trying to find any area that they can gain a smidge of advantage. And Michael's doing a great job at doing this. We see two rabbits in play. Both of those rabbits, again, just very strong cards, allowing Michael to draw cards, especially when Christopher doesn't have something like a Diablo, where Christopher would also be drawing cards as well. Michael's creating a hand advantage, seeing more cards in his deck than Christopher is. And slowly but surely, getting to that point where we, I mentioned earlier in the game, you know, you have this slog between both of these decks until one of them eventually starts winning on the board, starts winning in your hand, and we see both players have very few cards in hand, but Michael definitely has the stronger board. Yes, and we see another Hidden Cove coming down. We see Christopher moving the Diablo to the Hidden Cove so that it gets enough strength to banish this Yen Sid very well, uh, a, a lot of good use out of this Hidden Cove and that ability. Yeah. You know, there's been... We've had quite a few locations since they first made their appearance in Into the Inklands. Um, and, you know, obviously Queen's Castle is a favorite, but Hidden Cove is, is a location that I think has seen some of the most play out of the locations out there. I would agree. It ended up being a staple in em Emerald Steel, and I'm not sure it's one that people expected initially. Uh, locations... It takes a lot for location to see play, I think. A lot of people are very wary of how good or bad they are, but people found it out very quickly just how important it is to keep your lower strength and lower willpower characters from being banished in these Emerald Steel decks so that you can leverage the advantage that you have with your Floodborne characters and your Buckies and Diablos. And so it's ended up being a very strong and very much played card in Emerald Steel for sure. And definitely giving you opportunities where you can play the Hidden Cove and surprise your opponent with a trade they didn't think you could make or giving you that little bit of extra willpower so that those cards that they may be holding on to to banish your characters don't banish them anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that Hidden Cove is just really, really strong in this deck. And I think that's why we're seeing... Michael and other players trying to banish it as soon as they can because of just all those reasons you mentioned. Oh, another long another. cave. Zeus. Another lightning bolt to take care of that Diablo. You know, something else I realized on Christopher's side of the board just now is we're pretty far into this game and he still just has only four <laughs> ink in his ink well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hasn't had a bunch to ink. In Emerald Steel, their, uh, their curve, their ink curve is a, a term in TCGs, which essentially just means... Um, how many of each cost card you're playing is not very high. So the ink curve's not very high. The most expensive cards that Christopher's playing are likely four or five cost cards. Yeah. And so he doesn't need to ink very much. But we do see Christopher pull a Flynn Rider there off the top, which isn't going to win him the game. 